Coming in a hot minute on Art Rocks, the far-reaching effects of climate change transforming landscapes and the artistic responses they inspire. The exhibition tells a series of stories about global sea level rise and the relationship between regions that are really far away in the Arctic and the Antarctic and what's happening here in our backyards as flooding increases and as we lose some of the coastal protection in the form of our wetlands. Transferable images. Art um, that would traditionally be hung on a wall, I put on people's skin. Um, also with the street art, what you would see hanging on a wall is now on this brick building. Beauty that goes more than skin deep. I would say about half of the people he's painted are my friends, or I know them. <laughs> so I feel like there's a lot of uh, characters in Cleveland that kind of stand out, because this isn't like a, a white-collar city. And finding hidden figures deep in the wood. All that up next on Art Rocks. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Hello, thank you for tuning in to Art Rocks with me, James Fox Smith, publisher of Country Roads Magazine. Please meet Tina Freeman, a photographer whose images are raising awareness about the beauty and the fragility of Louisiana landscapes with audiences here and all around the world. Freeman's most recent body of work, Lamentations is a starkly beautiful reflection on climate change, seen in the juxtaposition between Louisiana landscapes and those of the high Arctic. Here's Russell Lord, curator of photographs at the New Orleans Museum of Art, to tell us more. Tina Freeman Lamentations is an exhibit of landscape photographs taken both here in South Louisiana and on both polar ends of the globe in the Arctic and Antarctic regions. And in the exhibition, you'll see each of the works is actually a pair of images, one from here and one from one of those places. And the idea is that the exhibition tells a series of stories about global sea level rise and the relationship between regions that are really far away in the Arctic and the Antarctic and what's happening here in our backyards as flooding increases and as we lose some of the coastal protection in the form of our wetlands. The images are in pairs or in the art history world what we would call a diptych and a diptych is just a pair of pictures that belong together in some way. The question that we pose to the viewers whenever anybody comes through the exhibition I always suggest that if they walk through with only one question on their mind, it should be, as they're standing in front of each of these pairs, why are these two images together? And I think everybody will come up with their own answer, but that's an important part of this project. In some cases, Tina has paired these images because they are formally similar. It looks almost as if, for example, that a hole in the ice in one picture could be filled with a little patch of wetlands in the other, as if they're kind of a negative and positive together. And then in other cases, there is a little bit more of a kind of conceptual relationship. For example, in the room we're in right now, there's a great pair of pictures, both shot from airplanes, one in Iceland and one in South Louisiana. And in each of those, you see something moving through something else. In Iceland, it's water carving its way through sand and silt. And in Louisiana, it's sand and silt carving its way through water as the Mississippi River deposits it at the end of its journey. So there are a lot of relationships to kind of tease out, and some of them are obvious and others are not. Tina Freeman has said that the goal of the exhibit is first and foremost to demonstrate the beauty of the Louisiana wetlands. She is born and raised in South Louisiana and grew up going out on boats into the wetlands and the bayou regions. And she really wants people to see these beautiful images of the wetlands 
and then also at the same time see something that is threatening their existence next to it. As these polar ices melt and add water and volume to the oceans, of course sea level is rising and as we know here, storms have been increasing in intensity and reaching further inland, partly because we've lost the buffer of the coastal wetlands. So as they're disappearing, Tina wanted to produce this lamentation for the loss of these Louisiana wetlands. In addition to being a visual photographer, Tina is very invested in the information that these photographs can provide. And at the beginning of the exhibit, you see two charts, one from 1934 and one from 2018, and they show the relative loss of the coastal wetlands. And then next to that, you see a list of place names that have been removed from those charts. And in fact, the last time they did that project was in 2011. They haven't looked back at the charts to see what other names might have needed to have been removed since then. But if you look closely at the place names, almost all of them are bodies of water, ponds or bays or bayous. And of course, for something to be a body of water, it has to have land surrounding it, identifying it as a body of water. And a lot of that land is what has disappeared over the years. So there is in the title, Lamentations, an implication that something is lost or being lost. And you see that right at the beginning of the exhibit. In one of the pairs of images you see, for those of us here in South Louisiana, something very recognizable, big liquid containment storage units. And next to it is a form that looks similar but is old and rusted, a group of tanks that are actually from a place called Deception Island in Antarctica. And one of the other links between these areas separated by thousands of miles that we might not expect is the oil industry. So obviously in South Louisiana those are oil tanks but on Deception Island, those tanks were designed to hold whale blubber, which of course, amongst other things, was rendered into oil. In another pair, which I think is one of the most powerful, it's one of the largest in the show, on the left you see this incredible ice cave that's in Iceland, and on the right-hand side you see an old abandoned pumping station near Morgan City in Louisiana. And on the left, their forms are similar, which is why they're paired together. There's almost this nautilus shell spiraling out in both of the pictures. But on the left, that glacial ice cave is actually enormous. If you look in the lower left corner, you can actually see a fairly large four or five person raft that is very small in the picture. So we're looking at an ice cave that is 20 if not more feet high looking out. And on the right is this abandoned pumping station which demonstrates how long we've been aware in Louisiana of the problem of controlling water and also how long we've tried to control it. That pumping station dates to around the turn of the, the century in 1900 and so it's now left there. It's not in use but it was once a way that we tried to control that water. And then in yet another pair there is a glacial landscape on the left with the bones of a musk ox visible in the foreground and it's an enormous skeleton. It almost makes Iceland look like a prehistoric landscape, as if these are the bones of a dinosaur or some extinct species. But I think the symbolism there is important. Extinction and the possibility of the loss of this ice in glacial regions. And next to it, you have an old abandoned gas pipeline canal with a fallen tree that as it's on its side with its branches splayed out sort of echoes the form of the rib cage and the musk ox next to it. So both of them become skeletal presences as if they are representing the specter of loss, of death. There is some heavy symbolism in the show. While the work is beautiful, there is a really powerful message to the show that a lot of people have been hit with when they come in here. The world is not that large and that things are interconnected and that what happens in one place affects people in another place. And yes, the world is changing and both of these locations, the polar ends or us here in coastal Louisiana, these places will not look the same in the future. I think the real question is, is it too late to change or to reverse these effects or another way that people have interpreted that question, what's the meaning of all of this, is what can I do? What should I do? Should I be inspired to help save the earth in some way to prevent sea level rise? This selection of 27 pictures was conceived of as an exhibition and the publication that we produced includes the exact same 27 pictures. 
And we do have hopes for this to travel. In fact, a number of institutions have expressed interest in showing this exhibition in places as far away as Iceland and Utah. So we're looking forward to working with other institutions to present this. Obviously, they recognize that even though this is in some ways a Louisiana story, it's a story that almost anybody can understand on a coastal level. Accomplished artists from near and far are showcasing works in communities near you. So here are some of our picks for notable exhibits coming soon to museums and galleries in your neck of the woods. For more about these and many more events in the arts, subscribe to Arts Monthly, a free e-newsletter from the editors at LPB and Country Roads magazine. Sign up is at lpb.org slash artrocks. And while you're there, the Art Rocks website features every episode of the program. So to see or share any episode again, visit lpb.org slash artrocks. Now, the story of an artist transitioning between two very different mediums. Leah Rizzo honed her craft as a tattoo artist, but she is also part of Wall Therapy, a mural project underway in Rochester, New York. You'll find Rizzo's murals at various sites around the city, reflecting her conviction that art belongs not only on the body, but also on the streets, where everyday folks can experience it too. Take a look. My name is Leah. I'm a Rochester-based artist. I'm from here. Uh, I was born here, went to high school here, graduated, moved away, um, came back to start a family, be with my family. And now that I have a family, feeling like investing in the community is really important um, and bringing back uh, what Rochester, I think, really strives to be, and I want to be a part of it. Art can add so much. I think the impact of having conversation about art is important. It's such an easy dialogue for people. It can be non-pretentious. It, it can bring all kinds of people together. I guess because I'm an artist, I can't think of life any other way. So I want to just share that passion with other people um, and make it easy. You don't have to go into a gallery. You don't have to go into uh, a museum necessarily to see art anymore. Um, taking it outside of those spaces, wearing it on your body, putting it on a building, it's I think just an easy way to share. Taking the art uh, that I like to do that would traditionally be hung on a wall, I put on people's skin and I, I can manipulate that art and then it's a wearable piece of art that is walking anywhere. People can see it anywhere. They don't have to pay money to see it. They don't have to walk into a place where they don't feel comfortable. It's an interesting feeling to see something walking around like that that was never intended to have that sort of view. I guess people who aren't, weren't looking at tattoos like that maybe even 10 years ago, but now it's, it's a walking canvas. It's being applied totally different, and the way people are collecting art is a different approach. And sharing that art moving forward has been rewarding. Um, also with the street art, um, bringing traditionally, again, what you would see on a, hanging on a wall is now on this brick building um, that's several stories tall. Anyone can walk by and see it. 
I met one of my sister's friends and when I was introduced, she said, I pass by your mural every day. I was thinking, well, what do you do every day that you pass by my mural? And she's like, I go to the hospital, and then I go home, and then I go to the hospital, and then I go home. And like, that's what you're talking about. That's that, that daily part that she's not walking into, a, another creative environment where you would see that kind of thing. I think that it's certainly been accepted in our community, and it, it has been one of those things that I don't think people realize they needed it so much. Um, you know, once one mural pops up, another one is popping up, and more people figuring out that they like this part about the community, and they can't explain why I never knew I was into art, or I didn't know, and I think just spiking that, that curiosity and love for, for an, um, a form that's kind of new for this city. Muraling is a fine line with even graffiti-based kind of art that it's public and in your face sometimes. Not everyone likes it, um, but that's the beauty of having conversation, um, whether it's good or bad. I think just anyone talking about artwork, having a dialogue of art is, is great, um, whether you know anything about it or not. Young people know, finding a path into the right career after graduating from college can be daunting to say the least. When Frank O'Reedy returned from college to his Northeast Ohio home during the early days of the Great Recession, he struggled to get traction until he realized he was anything but alone. And then he began to paint. My mom came home with this Norman Rockwell uh, address book and I want to say every few pages had one of his paintings in it and what struck me was for the first time I was seeing work that was so realistic that it looked, you know, almost photographic. He was taking a drawing class, a model drawing class at Tri-C at the age of 14. I think that's when I knew this is going to be Frank's thing. I think this is going to be his profession or niche. After I graduated Bowling Green, it would have been spring of 2007. I really didn't have a huge plan or really had no clue of what I wanted to do. I knew that, you know, I'd just gotten this degree in painting and drawing and there's not really a lot of things you can do, especially in Cleveland at the time where you're using your art degree unless you're going into art education or you you know are in a more commercial kind of arena but for painting and drawing you're kind of limited so I wasn't really sure what I was gonna do but I moved home and I moved back into uh, the house that I grew up in and I think at that time I started thinking about how a lot of my friends and myself included, all left our, our part of town to go away to college or go to the military. And, you know, with the understanding that we were gonna go out into the world and not return or return under different circumstances. And then we all ended up coming home. And that struck a chord with me and I, I started thinking about that. I would say about half of the people he's painted are my friends or I know them. <laughs> so I feel like there's a lot of uh, characters in Cleveland that kind of stand out because this isn't like a, um, a white collar city, you know, it's kind of blue collar, a lot of uh, creative people kind of stand out in the city as opposed to other big cities. So I feel like it captures what Cleveland really is. I had a problem with drugs. Uh, I was addicted to opiates for a while, and I still am an addict, but I've been clean for three years. Frank is uh, dedicated, he is charismatic, he's very intelligent, and he's honest. He's one of the most honest people I know, and he's very supportive. I've seen people paint realistically, obviously, before, and photorealistically, which is what he does. 
What impressed me was the fact that, that there, was, there was so much feeling and so much a sense of the presence of the person in these paintings. Um, in his own self-portrait, which was, I think, the first thing I saw of his, and, and in a number of other portraits of young men and women, usually, who apparently were members of, of his circle and his family uh, in Parma. I was blown away. That was something I've never really seen done before, like painting tattooed weirdos, but in such a fine art style. I mean, just how much it looks like everybody, just like the detail of even like the vest I was wearing, like just like denim and uh, just hair, even like the little strings coming off of fabric, like it just blew my mind. I would say that it was definitely a, a generational thing that we were experiencing this decision or lack of decision making that all kind of had us returning home. Trying to show that uncertainty or that struggle that we were experiencing, we are experiencing as a generation. That was one of the main goals and what I was trying to accomplish in the earliest portraits. He didn't give up. He just like, he worked in a steel mill to support, to pay for everything so that he can continue to do this. Like he did a lot of uh, odd jobs, went back to work, but this he stayed true to his art form and he just persevered. He's a guy with, with a lot of, um, a lot of hope that is focused in a way that, that is a little bit off-center. You wouldn't expect these paintings to be produced by a hopeful guy, by a guy who, who has Norman Rockwell informing his unconscious, by somebody who has that kind of American dream in, in the background. I think that, in the end, is, is what those early discouraged people in those paintings are about, is the fact that, that he himself really is, is a man of considerable hope and determination. And he believes in himself. He believes that he can do it. And, and the world is responding to this. Frank is a success story. I think he'll continue to be. Heading up to Duxbury, Massachusetts now to consider the finer points of wood and the special relationship some artists feel for this ancient, endlessly workable raw material. Prickly pencil point sculptures, history re-rendered, painted planks that pop. It's an exhibition of wood as muse, and for virtually all of the artists here, it always has been. I have to say, it probably started when I was a kid. I had Tinker Toys and um, Lincoln Logs, and they all had paint on them, and they were a good color, and I, I loved them. They were <laughs> fabulous. For me, it's just building forts and backyard hideaways. I climbed trees as a kid, <laughs> and I climbed to like the top branch, and, and the whole tree would move, and I thought that was really cool. For the 11 artists on view here, Wood is key not only to what they work with, but how they work. We didn't want people who were just carvers. We wanted people who used wood for its intrinsic magic. And um, somewhere along the way, we stumbled upon the idea that wood is kind of, it's a partner. Andy Moorline is an artist and co-curator of the show with his partner, Donna Dodson. His sculpture stems from his interest in so-called scholar's rocks the Chinese tradition of collecting stones to make interiors feel more like exteriors. But he says his work is also very much born of his Alaskan upbringing. I've always tried to find ways to sculpt or express that incredible variety of white snow against gray rock, against edge, and the forms of, of landscape that has been so pressed by glaciers. Dodson sculptures, she says, celebrate the relationships between humans and the animal kingdom, all tying to Egyptian art she first saw as a child. That's been influential for me in terms of you know, animal-headed sort of goddess figures and just thinking about representations of women, you know, and thinking about um, work that's deeply personal and also um, inspiring. When you ask, you know, like, do we control the wood as a wood control the piece? And um, 
you know, like we both see it as such a dance. Here, artist Breon Dunnigan has crafted trophy heads. Look closer and you may recognize furniture with a new lease on animal life. Pat Keck has produced the puppets that star in this devastating film titled Night and Day, about the suicide of a tormented gay man. Come the early 1950s, their kids, my aunts and uncles, had done what they were supposed to do, except for one, my uncle Donato. Provincetown artist Mike Wright creates sculpture only out of wood that has served life. Wood has energy in it, I think because it was a living thing. She scours the beaches and even dumpsters around her home in Provincetown for washed up wood, remnants of boats, cabinets, and furniture. I um, kind of have that element of the find, you know, the hunt. And then I get to walk my dogs on the beach while I'm doing this and drag whatever it is back to the studio. And then I just kind of let the wood tell me what it wants to be. It, you know, I wait for it to say, hey, I want to hang out with that piece. And, and then I can start to like put the shapes together and then the form starts to come along. For much of the work here, Wright took her inspiration from artists that captivated her at the Provincetown Art Association and Museum. All those modernists I would look at every day and I thought, you know, I could probably take something that they had painted and push it into the 3D. And that, so that was very appealing. Are you expert at removing splinters? <laughs> well, you know, I have to get a tetanus every once in a while. I think I'm due. <laughs> <laughs> it's the perils of the job to work with a material that enchants all of the artists here. Because wood is intrinsically its own, even before these artists make it their own. And that is that for this edition of Art Rocks. As always, you can search, see, and share any episode at lpb.org slash artrocks. And if you're wondering what else you might be missing out on out and about in the Bayou State, Country Roads Magazine is a resource for cultural events, ideas, and destinations all over Louisiana. And with that, I've been James Fox Smith, and thank you for watching. Art Rocks is made possible by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you.